Hello. Hello, hello. Happy Wednesday. How's everybody doing? Again, we're going to take communion at the end of the message. And I think I want to do that. I think I'm going to do that for the rest of this month. So get your bread. Um, if you don't have bread, get some crackers. If you don't have juice, get some water. Something that will represent the juice and the bread. And let's begin. Before I bring you the message God wants for you to hear today, let's pray. All right? Lord, you love me. You love your people. And I love you for this. I love you for loving me. And I love you for you, for your patience, for your love, for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for your steadfastness, for your dependability even for your sense of humor, for being a father of all fathers, my father, my papa, thank you. You are fixing my brokenness, showing me all you've placed in me, all you have for me, so that I can be all you created me to be, despite the past. Thank you. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord God Almighty, great I am, creator, master. I love you, Jesus, king of all kings, lord of all lords, soon coming king. I thank you. I adore you. I love you, Holy Spirit, comforter, guide, helper, keeper of the truth, God present with us, thank you. I adore and worship you. Oh, Lord, I come. I surrender my all to you. I rest in you, your sureness, your omniscience, your omnipotence, your omnipresence. You alone are God. You alone are my God, our God, our Lord, our King, our Abba, Father, Savior, Papa. Thank you. Thank you, holy, righteous God, good God. Thanks for making me see, making me hear, making me know, making me go your path. That's what I want to do what I delight to do, what I desire to do. Thank you. Thank you for making me obedient to your heart. Bless you, Lord. And as I speak, I'm your mouth. This is your message. Speak through me. Give the, the, the ears of the hearers that grace to hear, eyes to see, grace us today that we receive of you that will transform us, bring us closer to you and further from the world and the things that so easily beset us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, I want to bring the message from Isaiah 49. And I haven't even thought of what I, I'm going to call this message. But I was just so impressed to bring to you today just how God feels about you. Just how God is thinking of you. There's so much around us. I was just looking at the news feed and they said 1.5 million people are going to suffer because they don't have rent to pay. And I was thinking, God so loves us. And he says for us not to worry about the things 
that we have need of, but sometimes we let our past, the things that happened in the past, prevent us from receiving his truths, how much he cares, how much he will take care of the things around us. So as I speak from Isaiah 49 today, I pray you hear, you see, so you can receive and be transformed and help others as a result. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Satan has asked me for you. He desires to sift you as wheat. He says, but when you come through this, he didn't say if you come through it. He says, when you come through it, comfort the brethren with the same comfort that I have comforted you with. And I'm, I'm, I didn't, I didn't think of that scripture till now because I'm following the Holy Spirit. So I'm, I want to read it. So I'm looking it up to make sure I know where it is. It's Luke 22, 31. Luke 22, 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. And think of how you sift wheat. You put it in a sieve. And you shake it up like this, shake it up, and as you shake it up, the shaft blows away in the wind and leaves the wheat. But there's a there's a breaking that's going on there as you sift it, a violence that's going on. So Satan desires to sift us sometimes. And Jesus said in Luke twenty two, thirty two, but I have prayed for you. And that always stands out to me. He says, I have prayed. He's already done it. Isn't that just like him? It says in Romans 8, he's interceding for us. He said, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, he didn't say if. You come through this. He says, when? And that's how God treats us. He knows what we're going to endure. He deals with it in the future. And now he's speaking to us in the present. When you are converted, strengthen the believers, your brothers, your sisters. And Paul repeats that in in 2 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 4. And I'm going to pull it up. 2 Corinthians 1. Verse 4. All right, here we go. 2 Corinthians 1, 4. He's talking about God. He said, blessed be the God. This one, this Father Almighty. And in verse 4 he says, Who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any, any trouble with the comfort we ourselves received from God. So when we are troubled, he comforts us. And then with the same comfort that he comforts us, we comfort others who are going through what we went through. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. So let's start Isaiah 49. Listen. That's how it starts out. <laughs> Isaiah 49.1. Listen. Listen, O isles. Unto me and hear you people from far. So he's talking to, think of it, 
out in the waters, those little pieces of land. He's saying everywhere around, including all the way out in the waters to the isles, listen to me. People from far, listen. He says, the Lord has called me from the womb. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother has he made mention of my name. The Lord called me, June, from my mother's womb. From my mother's belly, he called me by name. Hallelujah. That's what he's done for you. From your mother's womb, from your mother's bowels, God called you. God called you by your name. Hmm. He didn't call you broken. He didn't call you stupid. He didn't call you ugly. He didn't call you fat. He didn't call you anything. He called you by your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen. Everything, everywhere, everybody, principalities, powers, from far and near, God called me by my name from my mother's womb. That's what God wants you to hear today. Verse 2 of Isaiah 49, and he made my mouth, he made my mouth like a sharp sword, like a sharp sword. He didn't make my mouth to speak negative. He didn't make my mouth to put people down. He didn't make my mouth. He made my mouth a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand. Has he made, he made me a polished shaft. He made me a polished shaft. And when you think of a shaft, and I'm going to go to the original Hebrew. Sometimes I, I don't think I'm, I'm looking at the Hebrew, not the Greek. And that the original meaning for that word shaft is is that like the head of a spear or the head of an arrow the head of an iron spear or a wooden spear something that's sharp it's the head of it the shaft the thing that pierces and wounds he made me a polished Shaft. So not only am I a shaft, I'm polished. Hallelujah. You know, when I, when I saw that word polished, immediately a picture came to me of a grandfather sitting on the stoop and he's polishing or he's whittling something and humming, just taking time, blowing on it, smoothing it out. He's polishing it. He's taking time to be intimate. And this word polished, I'm going right to the Greek. I'm not bothering to say the Greek word, but I'm going to tell you what the Greek, well, it's bara. And, and what it means, and I love it, is to separate and remove impure things. It's to cleanse, like an arrow, take the rust off of it, to polish it to a point, to sharpen it, hallelujah, to pare it down, to become a point of a weapon, to make pure and upright. So God has made my mouth like a sharp sword. He's made your mouth a sharp sword a polished shaft in his quiver. And that quiver is that basket where you put the arrows in. They usually carry it like on their back. And they put the arrows or on their side. And they pull the arrow out and shoot it in the bow. 
pull the arrow out and shoot it in the bow. That's what your quiver is. The Bible says in in Psalm 127, blessed is a man whose quiver is filled with children. So you are his sharp, polished shaft in his quiver. He hid you. He hid you in his quiver. So all the things that you've come through, you know, think of all the things that so easily beset you, the things that are happening to you. God is hiding you so that here you are today, a conqueror. Verse 3, he said to me, you are my servant. You are my servant, O Israel. And remember, whenever the Bible talks about Israel, believers are grafted in. Romans 11 tells us, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to it and read it. Because I say this all the time, but I never quote the scripture of itself. I wrote a minute. Romans 11. Okay. So he says we're grafted in. Here I go. Romans 11. All right. So here we are. And it's a lot, it tells us a lot about about it in um, Romans 11. But I'm going to go straight to one particular verse. Okay. All right. So, there's, uh, there's so much. And I'm trying to find um, the exact one that I want to to talk about. That we, okay, verse 16 of Romans 11 says, For if the first fruit be holy, that's Israel, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and you, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them you partake of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. So we are grafted in. And that's what he tells us. Don't be high-minded. Because we're grafted in. And if God didn't spare those natural branches, then we need to be careful. So we are grafted in. Verse 24, you were cut out of the, of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted, contrary to nature, into a good olive tree. So we are grafted in. So wherever the Bible speaks of Israel, it's speaking of the church also. It's speaking of Israel because Israel is God's firstborn. He's always going to love them and bring them to a place of recognizing him. But we also are adopted into that family. So he said in Isaiah 49, 3, he said unto me, you are my servant, O Israel, O church, O June, whatever your name is, say it, O, in whom I will be glorified. God is going to be glorified in our lives, regardless. As we turn our face to him, as we understand that he's called us from the womb, he's made us his, he's made our mouth to speak of him, he's made our mouth a sharp, polished shaft in his quiver, not anybody else's quiver, not the world's quiver, not Satan's quiver, we are sharp, polished shafts in God's basket. In verse 4 of Isaiah 49, it says, Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. 
it's, and you know, sometimes that feeling comes to me when, you know, when you're upset, when things aren't happening the way you want it to. You feel that way. Man, I did all that for nothing. So I've labored in vain. Whatever has happened to you in the past, all those vain things, or if you feel you've wasted your time doing something and nothing came out of it. But I love the next word after that in the middle of Isaiah 49. It says, yet, yet, surely, some translations will say, but. You see, whenever that word but is used, it means that something happened and now we're going to shift. So all these things in the past, say from this minute backward, all in vain, yet, but, surely, surely, and what does that word surely mean? Yet, surely, truly, nevertheless, certainly, but, nevertheless, indeed, it emphasizes, yet, Surely, my judgment is with the Lord. He's the one who decides what I am, who I am. He called me from the womb. He says, June, you are good enough. Well, I don't feel that way. Well, the people around me aren't telling me that. June, I called you from the womb. I named you. You are good enough. But Psalm 139 Psalm 139, verse 14, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139, I'm going to it. Psalm 139, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Verse 14 says, I will praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And my soul knows right well. Listen, who you are on the inside knows the truth. Because the truth dwells in you. We just have to get in tune with that truth. We just have to get in alignment with that truth that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Somebody said to me today, you know, I've put on a lot of pounds and it's really troubling me. Welcome to the club. I have too. But we've got to get beyond when we start focusing on the things that are negative about us. Do you realize it reinforces it? He says in verse 13 of, of Psalm 139, you possess my reins. You have covered me in my mother's womb. That's two witnesses, Isaiah and now the psalmist. It says in verse 1 of Isaiah 39, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my down sitting. You know my uprising. You understand my thoughts from afar off. Before I even think of what I want to think about, you know. Verse 3, you come past my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. He knows me better than I even know myself. He knows you better than you know yourself. Nobody knows you as best as he did because he created you. He created you. It says in verse 4, there's not a word in my mouth, O Lord, that you don't know it. He knows what I'm going to say. You know, sometimes I would tell the children, don't even say it. I didn't say anything. I heard you before you spoke. God knows before we speak what's in our tongue. You have beset me behind and before. You've laid your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. We've got to focus on this God that loves us, that called us from the womb. Sometimes we focus on all the bad things that happen around us. We focus on the bad things that our children do, and we speak it out of our mouth and make it worse for the children. We need to know what God says and says, yet, but, 
certainly, despite of it, God says, and I choose to believe, where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? Nowhere. If I go up into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand shall hold me like Jonah in the belly of the whale. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light around me. So darkness is light to God. Nothing stops him. Yes, the darkness does not hide from you, verse 12, but the night shines as day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you possessed my reins. You've covered me from my mother's womb. I will praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows right well. My substance, who I have become, was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth when my mom and dad came together, when your mom and dad came together and that sperm and that egg met before you were twinkling in your daddy's eye. His substance, I'm sorry, your substance was not hid from him. Your eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect. And in your book, all my members are written, and that's why we cannot abort children, because God knows them intimately. He's written about them in his book. It's not a blob. It's a human. So then it's murder which in continuous were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. When there was none of me, God wrote in a book and he continually fashioned me. And as he fashioned me, I'm written in his book. How precious also are your thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them if I should count them. They are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still there. Wow. Wow. When I awake, no matter what I went to sleep feeling troubled about, no matter what I went to sleep fearing, concerned, when I awake, I'm still with God. He's still right there. His thoughts are still there for me. And he will slay the wicked. And it goes on to speak about that, that God will deal with it. So we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Back to Psalm 40, um, Isaiah 49. So though we've labored in vain, though things have happened that we didn't like, don't want, can't deal with, maybe too much credit, maybe in debt, can't pay the rent, can't pay the mortgage, Maybe somebody had to go to jail or there's a fear of jail. My spiritual mother, her son-in-law, her grandson-in-law, was just told by the doctor yesterday that he has cancer in the lymph nodes. I think it's lymphoma cancer or something like that in stage four. No matter what you're facing, this God cares and is able surely my judgment is with you lord my work my work my work is with my god so all my labor now is focused in him because he loves me he has a plan and a good purpose he loves you he has a plan and a good purpose for you. Isaiah 49, 5 says, and now says the Lord who formed you from the womb to be his servant. He formed you from the womb to be his servant. He didn't form you from the womb 
to be poor and languishing. He didn't form you from the womb to be sick and desperate. He formed you to be his servant. And he takes care of his servants. His worshipers, those who worship him, those who love him, those who are led by him, those who choose him, that's who he formed you to be, who he formed me to be. So verse 5 again, now says the Lord that formed me, you, from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again, to bring his people again to him. That's one of our purposes. When Jesus rose from the dead, he spent 40 days on the earth, you know, visiting different people, saying different things. And one of the last things that he said before he went up to heaven, and one of the last things he said before he went to the grave, is that we should be his witnesses. Acts chapter 1 tells us that. I'm going to it. These are these are not part of my plan, but I'm following the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1. He tells us before he went up to heaven, it says he showed himself alive and were seen for 40 days speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And when he was assembled with them, he commanded them, do not depart, but wait for the promise of the Father. For John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And he says in verse 8 of Acts 1, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Have you received power? Because the Holy Ghost has come upon you. If you haven't, here is something you need to ask God and learn about. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. When you give your heart and your life to the Lord, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you. But now, when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, He comes in more power upon you gives you a special language that only he and God can decode unless he tells you how to decode it or, or unless he gives somebody the gift of decoding. When he comes upon you, nine gifts are available for you to use. Why? To be witnesses, verse 8, to be witnesses unto him. That's our job. So going back to Isaiah 49, he says, you are my servant to bring Jacob again. Jacob represents the believers, to bring the believers again to him. Though Israel, and I love this part, this part, it says a lot right now, though Israel be not gathered, though the church, Israel, the believers, though were not gathered Yet shall I be glorious in, in the eyes of the Lord. I, you are glorious in the eyes of the Lord, even though we cannot gather together like we should. We're glorious in the eyes of the Lord. And I love the last phrase in Isaiah 49, 5. It says, and my God shall be my strength. It didn't say he's going to give me strength. It didn't say I'll receive strength from him. It says he will be your strength. God is our strength. Hallelujah. Think about it. We read earlier in Isaiah, I think it's 43, that we're just grasshoppers to him. That's how small we are. He is our strength. He's our strength. And so we need to sit down and think about these things, ponder it, let the Holy Ghost settle it in our hearts so that we're not focused on all the bad things that are happening around us and we're missing out on what he's done for us, who he's called us for. It's like 
Really simply put, I've got a Kirby vacuum cleaner in my house. My house is filthy. My floor is filthy. And I've got the Kirby vacuum cleaner, expensive vacuum cleaner, sitting in the corner. And I'm not using it. And that's what we do to God. We don't use what this God, this great mighty God has done for us. Given his life for us. And we don't make a veil of what that means. That means everything. Everything. It means everything that's against us was defeated at the cross. He said the last thing to be defeated is death. So Isaiah 49, 6 says, and I'm coming to the end. There's so much. And I'm not going to go much further. I'm hoping that it will help you go further. It says, it is a light thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to raise up the believers, and to restore those who are preserved. It's a light thing. But I have also given you to be a light to the Gentiles, that's the unbelievers, that you may be my salvation unto the end of the earth. We when we walk with God, proclaim salvation like he told Peter. When you come through this, comfort the others with the comfort you've received. And remember what salvation means. Not only that Jesus died on the cross for us, but within that is deliverance welfare, prosperity, victory. Within that is health. Help. So much. So much is in salvation that God has for us. So much. So what is it that's easily besetting you now? What is it that's upon you that's, that's just making you depressed? that's just causing you to want to hide, that's just causing you to feel like, listen, our emotions are not our God. Our emotions are just a guide so we can see what's going on, so we can stop and take stock and turn to our God. He says, cast your cares upon me, for I care for you. And as First Peter 5 Cast your cares upon me. He says, take my yoke upon you. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen, listen, this is the God that loves you. Let's get our elements. This is the God that loves you, that called you by your name. What are you going through now? Don't let it name you. That's not what God called you. He called you by your name, your victory, your dominion, your health, your deliverance, your salvation. This is who you are. You belong to the heavenly God, the God of the universe. We're the king's table. So we have to stop acting and living like if we are servants of the world, like if we're paupers, like if we're poor, we're going to get evicted. No, we're his servants, his children, the ones he loves. He called us from the womb. He called us from our mother's belly. He loves us. So let's take the bread and we're going to read from 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11, we're going to read from, as we take communion today to come to the end of this message that I hope helps. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 says, be you followers, even as I also am of Christ. So I want you to follow me as I follow Christ to get the victory. Don't think I don't feel depressed. I don't feel this or I don't have this problem or that problem, but I refuse to let it name me. I refuse to live by it. I choose what God says. 
I choose. He is truth. John 14, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14 says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We need to use the Word, which is God himself, to stand on the truth so the angels can hear it and answer our prayers. We need to understand that Jesus went through everything we will ever go through. And how did he deal with it? We see on the, in the wilderness when the devil was tempting him, when he was hungry for 40 days and 40 nights, he went without eating. How did he deal with temptation? He said, it is written. You use the word like I just read to you from Isaiah 49, Psalm 139. It is written, you use the word, that's your weapon of warfare. When Jesus comes again, the Bible says he'll have a sword coming out of his mouth. And on that sword is written what? The word. The sword has the word. Hebrews 4 says the word is sharp. Sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces, divides asunder, soul and spirit. That word sees right into our bone, right into Stephen who's having that cancer in his lymph nodes. The word sees right in there, and the word has health in it. The word is health because Jesus is the bomb of Gilead, and Jesus is the word. So listen, don't let it be in vain. You say, like we said in Isaiah, all the stuff that's happened yet. Yet, but I will praise God. I will turn to God. He's my judgment. He'll make the decisions. He is my strength. Amen? So let's take it. It says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord, the same night which he was betrayed, took the bread, give thanks, and when he had broken it, he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. This is my body. Let's eat his body. After the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this is the cup in the New Testament, in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Drink. And by this we are declaring, we believe you are our strength. You are our salvation. You are everything to us. Amen. God loves you. Don't let it be in vain what he's done. Don't let your emotions be your God. You tell your emotions. Go. Just like he said, tell the mountain. Go in Jesus' name. Amen. He loves you. Amen.